Hello, Jeremy. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Now, it is your night, I believe, in Nashville, early morning for me. How are you feeling tonight? You've had a busy day by the sounds of it. Yes, I flew back from uh, Pittsburgh today, back home to Nashville. I was uh, there seeing Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band last night. So it was a 24-hour, one of those 24-hour turnaround trips where you just feel like you'd never leave the airport. Yeah, I swear every time I look at your Instagram story, you're in another state or another country. So I don't know how you do it. <laughs> Yes, that was the 30th city I've been in this year. Jeez. Yeah, you're a busy man. And we're going to talk all about every single thing that you do because you do a lot. But for the people that might not know you, can you tell us about how you kind of got started in the music industry and, you know, got to where you are today? Well, I'm a Nepo baby. That's how I got started in the (laughs) industry. My late father was a concert promoter and artist manager named Rob Potts. So I grew up around the music industry as a child and sort of had a context for it as just being a a job that people did. It wasn't any weirder for me to know people who worked in music than it was to know people who worked at a bank or worked at McDonald's or whatever. So I always grew up with that being normalized. And as a kid, I was more interested in writing and filmmaking and pursued that. Um, as a teenager, and that sort of intersected with music towards the end of my time in high school and my early adult years. I started doing music videos, and I, I directed a film that had a music component. But then also I started working with my dad on some uh, social media stuff that was like a burgeoning thing at the time. And I was kind of like, hey, you're looking at working with these artists. They should have, my, at the time, MySpace profiles and we you know we should be doing all this um graphic stuff and and video content and i was um, doing tour ads and so without sort of really intending to get into the music business i just started doing more and more of that work and what started as me being a filmmaker who was doing music stuff that sort of just grew and grew and i became more involved as we started managing more artists, I became more and more involved in that, which was, you know, with Morgan Evans initially, and then uh, Jasmine Ray for for a long time. And then CMC Rocks, the festival that I assuming most people listening to this will be aware of. um, That started in 2008. And I was involved in that from the beginning. So that was kind of, that's the capsule version of my first 10 years in music. Amazing. I can imagine that would have been a pretty incredible way to grow up just surrounded by music and all of those, you know, amazing people. It was, I mean, it was obviously an incredibly privileged way to grow up, but at the time you don't really have a context for anything else. Like it's kind of like, I've got a, um, a birth defect in my feet. So my feet get sore really easily. I can't walk long distances. I get all this preferred back pain and stuff and people always like I was in that like they asked me to compare it to what it would be like to have normal feet and like I have no idea I've never had normal feet and I didn't have a childhood where I didn't grow up around the music industry so for me that was very normal it was just this is what my parents do this is what the people that my parents work with do these are people I I know and and honestly because it was Australian country music it always had more of a sort of down to earth vibe to it anyway. So it didn't, I think if I'd grown up, you know, around the top 40 pop world or, you know, around a bunch of like indie rock bands or something that would have had that sort of patina of slick glamour to it. And I would have definitely felt the like, it's weird that I, go to a public high school and hang out with a bunch of other normal kids. And then sometimes at night I'm, you know, backstage with the living end or whatever it is, but it wasn't that it was like the kind of people who I was around then, you know, like Australian country artists, part of the whole deal is that you're not meant to think of yourself as better than the audience or act like a different kind of person. So it always had that kind of, um, it, it never felt like that was that kind of separation. Yeah, no, and that's really good. I'm sure that's important in your, you know, formative years. Now, the next part I'm reading off because 
I can't remember all of this, but you are a filmmaker, writer, music manager, producer, promoter. Is there anything else that I missed there? Um, yes, but I feel <laughs> that's, that's already, I feel like a long enough list. I mean, I, you know, I'm technically a songwriter. I've, I've got songwriting credits. Um, I'm a photographer. Maybe you said that one. I can't remember. I don't know. No, I mean, that's no, enough. Wasn't in there. Sure, that's enough things. <laughs> That's another thing. So if you can answer this, what do you enjoy the most out of, you know, everything that you do? Obviously you kind of started with filmmaking. So is that what you do still enjoy the most or do you just love it all? It, well, I do love it all or I wouldn't do all of it. I mean, the, the, the kind of, um, I guess, cop out answer is it's, it's either whatever I'm in the middle of doing or whatever I'm just about to start doing tends to be the thing that I love the most because I'm either right in the thick of something and you know, it's happening and it's incredibly satisfying. Like there's nothing more satisfying than standing at the back of the crowd at CMC when the headline is about to walk on and feeling that like rush going through the crowd. But at the same time, when CMC is wrapped up for the year and I'm exhausted for that, and then I've got a, you know, something coming up, like I'm going into the studio, with an artist I work with in a few weeks, that becomes the thing that I'm most excited about because that's all anticipation and, you know, looking ahead to something that's going to be magical. But I'm lucky that I never get sick of anything that I do because there's always something else going on that I'm juggling at the same time. Yeah, I'm sure that's probably like most people in the creative industry. There's always something different going on, so it's hard to get bored or, you know, feel like you're stuck doing the same thing every day because you're usually not. Yes, it's a it's this double edged sword of like arguably, and many people have argued it to me. I do too many things. I you know I'm a workaholic. I don't take holidays. I don't really enjoy taking time off. So I'm always spinning plates, and I've always got a bunch of different things going on with different people. But at the same time, like it means that life is always fulfilling and exciting and dynamic because I never get stuck in a rut with anything. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a great way to live. Definitely. Now, if we're talking about music videos and content, you obviously do a lot of that for your artists and other artists as well. What would be if you could give some tips for, you know, creating a great music video, creating great content for artists, what would your top tips be? That's an interesting question. I feel like there's diff two different answers and it depends whether you're talking to the artist or you're talking to somebody who's trying to get a career in making music videos, because I tend to think of like, even though I'm a filmmaker, I came at music videos because I wanted to make films, but you know, no one's going to give a teenager the money to go and make a two hour movie, but you know, you might be able to get work doing a music video, which means someone else is paying for it it's going to come out because it's attached to a song that's going to come out. You don't have to find the distribution. You can just make the thing it's done. And then it's someone else's problem. But I think a lot of people approach music videos as being like short films or little art pieces or whatever. And it's not that they're not those things, but what a music video primarily is, is an ad for the artist. And I think people like resist that categorization sometimes because it sounds like it's that means it can't be artistically valid or fulfilling or dynamic or whatever. But I don't think those are exclusive things. But I think the number one job of a music video is to communicate the artist's point of view and how the artist wants to be represented visually. So finding a concept, a style, a representation that tracks with the artist because it's the artist's face on screen and it's not the artist like they may be playing a character in the context of the video but it's their song that they're singing you know if it's a you know it's a, it's a keith urban video for example i'm not that i've done the keith urban videos but if it's a keith urban video like that has to represent keith the way that keith wants people to see him because that is how people will see him after they've watched the music video you can't come along and be like yeah i just want to make this like you know gritty drama about a serial killer um, and I'm going to do that through the context of this music video because then like what has that got to do with the artist so I think that's the number one most important thing and then the second thing is it has to represent the song 
which doesn't necessarily mean represent the storyline of the song because sometimes that can be just kind of boring and lame and weirdly undermine what the story of the song is because like Keith used to call these um sea truck sea truck videos where it'd be like the lyrics like I was driving down the street in my four by four and then it's just like a shot of someone driving down the street in the four by four and you're like I kind of got that already from just <laughs> listening to the song I didn't need that to be in the video so I always sort of start from like is there a way to visually represent the, the theme of the song or the idea that's like emotionally powering the song in a way that isn't so straightforward but makes sense you want it to feel natural but you don't want it to feel redundant you don't want it to feel you want it to add something to the experience of listening to the song and deepen what the artist is trying to say and also what the artist is trying to say about themselves because i generally think if someone's chosen a song to be a single part of that decision making process is I want this song to show this side of me. I want this song to show that I am like a dynamic up tempo performer who would be really cool live and you should put me on your festival. Or, you know, or it could be everyone thinks of me as like this like sexy glamorous person, but this song shows that I've got like depth and sophistication as an artist. So the the video should try and represent that somehow. So I think it's always important mm. to start from those first principles. Yeah, no, those are some really great tips. My mind's going 100 miles a minute when you're saying that. I'm like thinking about every music video I've ever done. <laughs> so thank you for mm-hmm. the tips. I will take those on board, definitely. Have you had any clips where you feel like the director you've hired is just trying to do, like this is something, just an idea they've been trying to get out there and it's kind of indifferent to whatever your song is actually about? Oh, not that I know of. I feel like I've always tried to have like a good handle on it and kind of tried to bring my ideas as much as possible. But I definitely have fallen into that trap of making things too literal, definitely. Um, so, yeah, I feel like I and for my next few songs, I was kind of thinking, I was like, how do I tell this story without telling it in such an obvious way? Um, so it is hard to, to figure that out. But I think it's good for us artists to be thinking about that for sure. So you have recently moved to Nashville. Um, which is very exciting. How did you come to that decision? I assume it's something you've wanted to do for a long time. How did that all happen? Well, I first came to Nashville 25 years ago in 1999. And as anyone who spent a lot of time here will tell you or has lived here for any period of time, it was in some ways a completely different city back then. But I think at its core, it's always been what it's been, which is this incredibly focused creative community it's like we don't really have you have these with some smaller towns in australia but the idea of just like a whole city that's about one thing cities in australia tend to be about you know a bunch of different things because we don't have that many cities really in the country and there's not that many people in australia but nashville it was just like everything is about music or healthcare technology but for my purposes my purposes and point of view like everything was just about music I mean, back then everything was about country music. Now it's a bit, it's much broader than that, but I just fell in love with the place. Even as a kid coming here when obviously I wasn't experiencing the nightlife side of things, but just something where like everything was about music. Everyone was involved in music. Everyone was like a part of creating art and creating music every day. And that's what I got up in the morning was just such an amazing, vibrant thing to be around. And also like the people here are so nice and generous and positive and affirming to be around and to interact with. So, you know, as a kid, it was just a place I liked. I didn't really have this concept of moving here, but I came, started coming here for work as an adult. I come back basically every year from 2008, I came over for at least one trip. I made a documentary film over here, made so many friends over here. And then in 2017, um, I moved over and I ended up, you know, spending most of the COVID years back in Australia. But, you know, then earlier this year, I decided to relocate full time here again, let go of my Australian place and just decided to be here as my home base. But the decision to move, I don't know, it's, 
it can feel very intimidating. It can feel like a massive deal, especially to people. Like I, I was talking to someone recently who was like considering the idea that they might need to move here long term for their career prospects, and it was just incredibly daunting to them because they'd just, I think at the time they'd never visited. And I, and I get that. Like for me, I'd probably been here three or four times before I really set my sights on that. But you can always go back. Like I'd say to anyone who's like scared about moving over or is like, like waiting for the right time, like there's never going to be a right time. There's always going to be some reason not to do it. And there was for me. And I probably could have come over two or three years before I did. But I just kept, you know, finding excuses not to do it. And then 2016, I spent a lot of time over here. I was making another documentary and I was just like in town a lot. And then I was also like doing other work like around CMC and stuff over here. And it just got to the point where I, I just thought to myself, if I just don't go home, I've moved. So I should just start thinking of it like, like I come here for weeks at a time or like sometimes like a couple of months and then I go back to Australia. What if I just don't go back to Australia? So when I moved over, I wasn't really that different. I took an extra suitcase and my guitar with me and then didn't go back to Australia for a long time. And that was moving. Well, there you go. You did it in a very relaxing way then. <laughs> Obviously, it's such like a big thing because it is the other side of the world. And, you know, if you're moving for your career, it can be so scary to put all that pressure on yourself. But, yeah, I don't think it needs to be done that way. You know, as you said, if you spend time there anyway, uh, you know, it's just an extended trip there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you got to live somewhere. You know, exactly. it may as well and be Nashville. Nashville's a good place. Exactly. Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> so you mentioned CMC Rocks um, and that's, you know, definitely the biggest country music festival in Australia, one of the biggest in the world, um, which you are an organiser of. How big of a job is organising something like that? I imagine massive, but I'd love to hear it from, you know, the man himself. Well, it's a massive, like... I should know this number definitively, but obviously like it, it moves around a bit, but I think about a thousand people work on the festival every year. So that should give you some sense of what a like massive undertaking it is. And it, I think about like, cause we're obviously pretty deep into putting 2025 together at the moment. And the amount of stuff that we are, wrapping up now for next year that we started working on last year before 2024 had even happened. It's just this incredible amount of moving parts, interacting like people, stakeholders, interests that all need to be considered and reconciled with each other. There's so much stuff that the public doesn't even see, which is like the underlying backbone of the festival happening and being what it is. And of course it's grown so much over the years. There's so much stuff that is at this incredible level of complexity around the festival now, which, you know, was very simple in 2008, like the first year we did it because there weren't, you know, when you've got a couple of thousand people on site versus 20 something thousand people on site, there is a lot more to consider and to deal with a lot more things that can go wrong, a lot more plans and contingency plans and, you know, things to figure out. So it's, it's only possible for it to happen at all, let alone be what it is because of the incredible team that puts it together. And everybody who works on it is crucial to the process. And some people have been with us like almost since the beginning. There's a couple of people who work on it who have been there since, you know, the last year we were at the Snowies in 2010. And there's a lot of people that have come on board over the years as the team has grown because the the size and scale of the event has grown but i just you know i've got um every year we do a star photo backstage at the festival and obviously like you can never get anyone in it um because if you got everyone in it the festival would grind to a halt because people always have to be doing something at any given point in time but it's always like you know 
a big group of the people who put it on and I've got those photos printed really big and framed and hanging all around my house because it's just a great reminder when I'm just like going about my day to sort of like I can look over here to my right and see the 2018 one and I can just look at any of those people and just think about what they do on the event and how fucked we would be without them. And there, you could, there's like hundreds of people you could say that about on the festival. And these things only work. They can only be as good as the people who put them on. I will say that. Yeah, definitely. And I think you see that, you know, there are so many new festivals, new country festivals coming up uh, nowadays. And obviously no one's doing it at that scale um, because I can, yeah, imagine it takes so much experience, so much team and, you know, you have to have those great people on board when you're there for those few days are you kind of stressed and worrying about what might go wrong or can you just really enjoy it i yeah i'm incredibly stressed yeah <laughs> i mean I, I try not to put that energy out on anyone else but there's like the the sheer number of of things that could happen at any second of the event and with all these scenarios of things that we've like talked through and gamed out and had meetings about in the lead up and we've had it incredibly, I was going to say incredibly lucky. Some of it is luck, like the weather, the weather you can only, you can't really control the weather. You can have plans to deal with the weather, but the weather's going to, going to happen. But most of it is planning for things that could, planning for things that could go wrong, making plans to prevent them going wrong and making contingencies for what to do when they do go wrong. So I am stressed about things that don't happen 90% of the time, but Every night when the headliner goes on stage and kicks off that first song, part of me relaxes a bit more because I know we've executed another amazing day. The crowd's having a great time. Nothing serious has gone wrong. And you go into the next day, like feeling like, okay, like, and the list, obviously every day, the list of anything that could go wrong gets smaller and smaller, but there's just, I try to not let that overwhelm me because a, you know, I'm there to do my job, but also because you want to be able to savor the moments. You want to be, I want to be able to actually like go side of stage and watch like Haley with a set and really take that in and see how she's connecting with the crowd and, or, you know, be walking around the site and checking in and all the activations and the, the VIP bar and everything and, and be proud of what we're doing and not be worrying about the hypotheticals, you know? Yeah, definitely. And speaking of artists and the incredible acts that you have on CMC Rocks, for, you know, so many country artists, CMC Rocks is that, you know, bucket list festival and gig. What do you look for in the artists that you book? There's a lot of complexity to this and it it can be different year on year. A lot of it stems from who our headliners are and obviously like the process of putting our headliners together is incredibly complex, can take more than a year. Sometimes the, you know, Sunday night headliner at the festival is an act we started a conversation about four years earlier and the timing, you know, acts at that level, everyone wants them to do everything at any given time. They've got six offers to be in different parts of the world or to be 20 minutes from their house and making, you know, a lot of money. So, it's, it can often be a long time to work on the process of aligning it so that it's the right time for them to come to Australia, the right moment for them to be playing CMC and the right time for us as well. So those conversations are happening with agents and managers sometimes for years, at least many, many months. And depending on who the headliners are, that can to some extent dictate the tone of the festival that year in the sense of you know artist x is going to be the headliner well then that tells you you know okay that will shift the composition of the audience that year to some extent May, okay this artist we're going to get younger fans who are more into what's really really hot right now in country music or it's this time of artist and maybe they're a little more country pop leaning or it's this artist and they're a bit more legendary so the audience the age range might be a bit broader so 
sometimes we're trying to complement that with the other artists on the bill. Sometimes we're trying to counterbalance that with other artists on the bill. And when it comes to Australian artists, there's a number of factors in play. Has this person played the festival before? Is it time for them to come back? Is it too soon for someone to come back? It might be like a good moment for someone to play, but they played last year. So it would be weird to repeat an artist like that. But sometimes we can do that if there's like a really particular reason why it makes sense to have them back right in that moment. Sometimes it can be an artist who I'm looking at and singing like, okay, they're really ready to step up their game. Like I've heard new music that's coming out. I know that's really going to connect or I have seen a recent show and they've really stepped their live game up. So it's the perfect time to give them an opportunity to play at the festival, play to that massive audience, play on a bill with those big, big international artists knowing that they can bring it. But there are so many shifting factors and you want to make sure that there's like a broad array of, you don't want it all to be artists who are like super rockin', like high, high energy, like rip the roof off, rip the roof off artists. And you don't want it all to be like, you know, super nuanced acoustic singer songwriter kind of artists, because if you have too much of any one kind of energy, it can become a bit monotonous over the course of three to five days at the festival. So it's all, it's a matter of balance. It's a matter of different considerations. And also it's a matter of like, who wants to come, who wants to play, who is at the right time for, who's got a record coming out, who do we think is going to be big next year? Because we're booking the festival, you know, sometimes 12, 13 months out, you know, we've got to be making predictions about who is going to be good to play in a penultimate slot for the headliner next year. And that person may not be at that level when we're making the offer, but we have to sort of make a, an educated look at where we think the landscape's going to be. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's so much that goes into it that the average person would definitely not think of, you know, they probably just think you say, yeah, I want them to play, I want them to play, but you have to really think about the audience and the whole entire day of, you know, how you want it to flow and how you want it to go. So yeah, a lot that goes into it. Yeah, absolutely. And people like, I remember when I took over um, from my father in uh, 2018 and that was the first year I became like really heavily involved in directing the programming. And a lot of people said to me like, Oh cool. You're just going to like put all your favorite artists on the bill now. And I was like, that's not, that's not the job. Like the job is to represent the audience and not, not in such a simple way as just like, we'll do a poll on the Facebook page and just book everyone that, you know, the people say they want the most, because again, there's an artist they may want next March who they don't know about now. We take the discovery side of things really important. So we're trying to introduce artists who people might not be familiar with and we book them as well, but it's about curating an experience that is going to resonate with the fans who have been loyal to the festival over the years and have built it into what it is. So when I'm, you know, talking with Susan Heyman and Georgie Luxton, who um, lead the programming aspect of the festival, what we're trying to capture is a amazing five day experience of music for the people who come to the festival year after year. It's not just about like, what am I listening to a lot on Spotify right now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I'm sure it would be a great festival for you if you just had all your favorite artists, but you know, maybe not everyone would like that. (laughs) Well, yeah, except that I don't really get to watch, like it's very rare that I get to watch a full set at the festival because I've got to, you know, there's a, there's 500 things going on at any given point in time. I watch some of every set, but you know, sometimes it's a, uh, you know, it bums me out. There's an, there's an artist that I like personally really love and I'd, it'd be great if I could just like find a good spot in the crowd and watch the whole set. But you know, that's not my job. No, busy man. <laughs> Speaking of your favorite artists, what are some of those artists you are loving in the industry at the moment and what are they kind of doing differently? This is a tricky question because I feel like Anyone I name now, people are going to assume that we've booked no, them no, no. for CMC Unrelated. next year. Unrelated. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, 
Uh, okay, let me think about this for a minute. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll um, name a couple of artists who aren't on the bill who we've had in recent years so that people wouldn't be expecting them to come back this quickly. Um, anyway, I think Lacey K. Booth's album that came out recently is one of the best albums that's come out this year, not just in country, but just anywhere. I think that has got, she's got such a voice and I don't, I don't just mean like a singing voice, which is amazing and, and incredibly distinctive, but she's got such a like tactile sense of voice as a artist and as a songwriter. And that whole thing is so lived in and real. And you can just like, every song you can sort of imagine the spaces that those stories are happening in and feel that there's a real person inside there. Like, I think for me, I really, it really bothers me when I hear music that feels like it was just done because it's imitating something else that was already successful. And the stuff that really connects and breaks through tends to be the stuff where people are going in the other direction where they're, going to something that's more personal and more distinctive to them because that's what they're going to do better than anyone else. Like that Lacey K Booth record, no one else could have made that record as well as her because it's so personal to her and she's built a sound around her voice that feels like it's this incredibly organic outgrowth about what she's singing about and who she is as a person and I think that is such a um, important thing to try and capture. So that record I think is really great. Um, Abby Anderson, I'm really loving at the moment. Um, I saw her set at uh, CMA Fest this year. And aside from just like, she is an incredible vocalist. Again, it's just that like incredibly deep soulful person behind the music that just comes through in such, and it's not like it, she makes like esoteric music that's out of the mainstream. It's just that she does it in a really like distinctive, authentic way that's really true to her. And I, I think the music she's making right now is the best music she's ever made. And I'm really excited to see what she does in the next couple of years. And I think like she could be really stepping up on another level of, of success and an audience with what she's doing right now. Yeah. Awesome. I love both of those ladies. I do want to get a bit more advice from you before you leave because you've Hit given me. me so much already. And I'm sure there's so many artists that are listening that are finding this valuable too. For you, obviously you spoke about those artists that are really standing out and doing things differently. What would be your advice to an artist that is listening that does want to try and stand out in such an oversaturated market? Yeah, I think that's the right question to be asking because I feel like, and, and this is something I've, I've said to a lot of artists when they like ask me for advice or people that I'm working with on the management side of things, is people spend a lot of effort trying to fit in and I feel like not enough time on how they stand out because fitting in is just about basically like, am I pitching my music to the right audience, to people who are going to be open to receiving it because like you're operating in a space that feels like a natural fit for your music. So if, you know, if you're a young country artist and most of your influences are a uh, country, you feel like you have a, a sound, a songwriting style that fits in that, then you're a country artist. And it's not that you should be indifferent to, to trends or to the realities of the industry. But like, once you've decided that you fit there, you're naturally going to be in that spot. So what makes you cut through? If you're a new artist, you're basically trying to go, Hey, stop listening, not stop overall, but like, Hey, you're, you're on the, you know, the Amazon country playlist and you're, you're listening to Morgan Wallen and you're listening to Carly Pierce or whatever. Stop listening to them. Start listening to me. Why would they do that? That's the thing you got to think, because if you're, if all you're doing is kind of a, you know, imitation or derivation of what somebody who's already really established and really successful is, you're probably not going to get any attention for that because people can just listen to the original version of what you're doing. So 
even if it's just one thing, like if you can say to somebody like, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm like, uh, Laney Wilson, but, and then think about what that is. And it doesn't have to be some like big contrived thing. Like I'm, I'm like Laney Wilson, but I dress as a clown on stage or whatever. Like, although that would be a distinctive thing, <laughs> you get, someone would check out that record and be like, okay, why does this person who like makes music that's a bit like Laney Wilson dresses as a clown on stage, but you know, there are different ways to go about that. You can, but finding your point of difference is so much of the ball game because otherwise you're never going to make it to the point where you can worry about like whether that's limiting commercially or not. I think people like hedge their bets so much, particularly in Australia, because it's a limited audience. People are worried that if they're too niche, they're going to run out of people to play to or people to listen to the music very quickly. And I don't think that's uh, something you shouldn't be concerned about. But I think in the long run, you've more got to worry about standing out enough to be heard in the first place. Yeah, definitely. No, that's such valuable advice. And I think that's what every artist should be thinking about. You know, it can be so easy to just get caught up in what is on the top of the charts and, you know, what is who we are playing the festivals and what they're doing. But, yeah, you can't copy someone else and you've got to be unique or there's no way you're going to, you know, find your your audience and stand out in this crazy, crazy music world for sure. So finishing off, what is in the works for you at the moment? Obviously you're organizing CMC Rocks. What's happening for you and your wonderful artists that you manage? Well, yeah, as you say, um, CMC, I don't think I'm really revealing anything here. Anyone who's been paying attention to the festival uh, in past years will know that in the coming months we will be rolling out the lineup and going on sale with CMC Rocks 2025. So that's obviously something we're hard at work on at the moment. I'm really excited about the lineup we have for next year and uh, I'm, yeah, can't wait for that to be out there and for everyone to see what we're putting together. Um, uh, Imogen Clark is the indie singer songwriter that I manage. She recently relocated to Nashville, her new album, The Art of Getting Through, came out at the end of May and she's just in the thick of like a myriad of tour dates. We did a UK run earlier in the year. She's got stuff in the US coming up. She's going um, to Australia in November to do a tour then and there's other stuff around that that's going to be announced in the in the next few weeks. It's also really exciting where I'm about to go to Los Angeles with her to finish some tracks for the deluxe edition of her record. So that's a flurry of activity. Um, Abby Ferris, friend of the show, Abby Ferris, um, we're working on her new EP that's going to come out. Uh, well, I won't say the date because we haven't announced it yet, but later this year, and she's just been writing incredible music. I'm so proud of the songs that, she's come up with over these two trips to Nashville end of last year and earlier this year. And we're in the middle of um, getting the tracks done for this EP. And it's just so exciting because like every time we get something new, it's just like leveling up, leveling up. And I can't wait for everyone to hear that stream. That ain't new, the new single that just came out. Um, yes, so that's yes. really exciting. Yeah. So that, those are the, probably the, biggest things in my immediate view i'm finishing a couple of film projects this documentary i directed about tommy emmanuel that is coming out it looks like uh probably next year sometime so we wrapped that up recently i'm working on another documentary project that might also come out next year depending on if i have time to finish that around everything else that's going on but you know just so many hours in the day Yes, I don't know how you find time to do it all, but somehow you do. And you found time to come on this podcast. So thank you very much for coming on. My pleasure. Thanks for having me.